I live in Vancouver, a city that scores high in international lists of most enjoyable cities around the world. In this first episode of The Knots, I try to explore why that is. 125 years is the age now, young compared to cities in other parts of the world where the history can be easily a thousand years old. And in those 125 years, the idea, the identity of what Vancouver wants to be has changed several times. And these changes did not always happen voluntarily. It had to adapt. I'm Gordon Price. Uh, I was born in Victoria in 49, so asked to run for office in 1986 by Gordon Campbell, and was in office for six terms from 86 to 2002. And then uh, now, since uh, 2005, been director of the SFU City Program. You know, you got to remember, fundamentally, this is one of the best places on the planet in so many ways, uh, location above all. Ice-free, deep water port, right next to a remarkably fertile delta, close to Asia, in a stable country that's not the United States, but still benefits from the advantage of living next to a neighbor that's going to keep you safe under its nuclear umbrella. Man, that, and it's new. It's new. Even its infrastructure hasn't really basically decayed uh, and is pretty well maintained so that we don't even have those kind of problems. We don't even have biting insects. I mean, this is a pretty good place to be, but fundamentally high density and mixed use and very high quality um, public spaces. Modernism, certainly after the Second World War, was the dominant architectural and design ideology. Made a lot of mistakes, learned a few things, uh, and then... What were the mistakes? Well, modernism was based, I'd say, just fundamentally on, on, on the idea that you can do things that are big and simple and flat and square. <laughs> You're just looking for uh, an ide ideology. So whether it's a freeway or a high-rise public housing project, uh, they're done on a massive scale, machines for living, very Corbusian. The aesthetics of modernism strip off the detail, use technology, form follows function, uh, the building should be honest and express itself. So you had this emergent, uh, emergence, whether it's in Toronto or the banlieue of Paris, of, of uh, tower housing blocks, typically slab construction, poured concrete, reinforced concrete, high-speed electric elevators, a way of providing a lot of housing very quickly with an ideology that said uh, we can create equality. Everyone can live in basically the same kind of, of development. This is Corbusier's idea of, um, of the, uh, oh, now I've forgotten it, outside Marseille, classic example. Mixed use, but um, the idea everyone would share more or less the same kind of urban form. Uh, people divide themselves out by class and ethnicity and just a whole bunch of things and they want to express that kind of individuality. And so you get these small, relatively small, very simple, big and simple, flat and square, high-rises emerging by the dozens in the 1960s. Almost every building over five stories in the West End got built between 62 and 72. And that's probably the fastest change a, a neighborhood went through in Canada, with the exception of places like St. Jamestown in Toronto. Um, but boy, it was fast and it was brutal. So Vancouver is lucky, but also not so lucky. When it started growing, it quickly ran into the ocean on the one side of the city and the mountains on the other side. And later in its development, it ran into the border with the United States of America. So quite early on, Vancouver had to find a solution to getting busier and busier. A principle that everyone I talked to for this documentary mentioned. Densification. What can a city do when its population keeps increasing to avoid its streets from becoming one big mayhem? There's always this option to spread out. That's what the automobile allows. And you get this car-dependent urban form. I call it motordom, M-O-T-O-R-D-O-M, a word that would have been used in the 1920s. At the time, the automobile was emerging as a popular form of transportation. Well, because of cheap oil and, and this... Uh, effusive technology that was for the first time in human history available to the average working person, land use followed. So you end up with the fundamental forms of what we call the suburbs. And again, it gets back to big and simple and flat and square. But the key is cheap land, 
cheap oil, cheap water, cheap money, <laughs> and the best quality of life human beings have probably ever had. And so every other culture that looked to North America now says, well, you guys are at the top of the food chain. That's the way you did it. Guess we got to do it too. You know, why else would they be building freeways in Shanghai, for God's sake? Um, it doesn't even make sense on the surface, much less. But it, it touches something profound. People like space. And when they get rich enough, uh, they buy more of it. So, you know, you've got to, uh, certainly from a governmental and planning level, acknowledge that. What Vancouver had no choice because it was imposed by nature, well, it couldn't expand. It very quickly came up against its boundaries. So if downtown Vancouver in 1890, man, we built out the downtown peninsula, about two square miles, having taken Stanley Park out of it, uh, probably by about World War I. No, earlier. So where are you going to go? Well, uh, you can still go out, obviously, and that's the first instinct. But I think Vancouver recognized right across the spectrum, rather like the Dutch did, uh, we are going to have to make density livable for all classes of people. If the dikes come down, uh, everybody drowns. If we're going to continue to be a growing city, uh, we've got to find a way to do it. The still, the rich always aspire to space. But they also recognize that there's got to be a range of livable communities uh, as you rebuild the city. And by the 1970s, when that spirit was fully embraced, I think, uh, we figured out a way to do it that at least met a pretty broad range of needs. But what made us exceptional? Well, uh, we had to go up. So we found a way to take the high-rise form that had been rejected uh, because it was associated with the poor and social failure and modernism and, and found a way to make it aspirational for people right across the social spectrum. And you've only got a couple of choices. You crowd, more people in the same amount of space, or you find a way to accommodate more people in more space. One of the ideas of densifying downtown and building high-rises was to create more urban life in the streets. And so we get mixed development with buildings partially as office buildings and with their upper portions as residences creating this urban life downtown so that the streets are not empty at night and presumably unsafe. Architect and real estate agent John Lightburn sees little evidence that this has really worked as the city had imagined. You know, you can still drive downtown certain streets and there's nobody on those streets, whereas you can drive out to an area like Commercial Drive where there's absolutely no density, it's basically suburban, and yet you have a street which is the most, one of the most liveliest streets in Vancouver. It's a chock-a-block with restaurants, stores, uh, Italian bistros, uh, specialty food stores, and every manner of person walking up and down the street, riding their bikes, skateboarding, rollerblading. <laughs> it's quite an interesting street. And yet we get that life on the streets, and it's happened in spite of a lack of density whereas part of the program for all of the downtown has been let's create density and have lively downtowns and lively streets and lots of restaurants and cafes. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's touted as a principle of urban, urbanism, but in fact, you know, there is no real logical connection, not necessarily a logical connection between the two. As most cities, what now is Vancouver Center was where the city originally started. Because of the challenges of being on a peninsula with a usable surface of less than six square kilometers, valuable lessons have been learned about densification. With populations growing globally, other countries want to learn from Vancouver. I talked to someone from the government of my own country of birth, the Netherlands. Ik ben Eline Toes, ik ben 29 jaar en ik ben Rijkstrainee bij het ministerie van Vrom. My name is Elina Tus. I am 29 years old and a trainee at the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and the Environment. Our chief architect studio sent me to the Dutch consulate to research sustainable urbanization. In Nederland is er een grote interesse om te kijken 
Hoe er in plaats van, of misschien wel ook in plaats van het zomaar nodig... Holland has great interest to, besides expanding our cities, see what we can further develop in the space that we already occupy. En die blijken er gewoon in grote getalen te zijn, zeg maar. Dat is, je kan denken aan de, de transformatie van oude industriegebieden. One could think of regions previously used as industrial areas or, for example, train yards. Maar er, er schijnt dus in de binnensteden van Nederland gewoon veel ruimte te zijn waar, waar heel goed... Um, die heel goed ontwikkeld kunnen worden. En, en ja, we zien veel ruimte in de Duitse Dutch cities that still can be developed. Because in Holland we do not have a lot of room. Dus daar zit eigenlijk de, de parallel. En Rijksgebouwmeester die is nu een aantal keer hier naar Vancouver geweest. En, uh, Our chief government architect has been several times to Vancouver. That, despite having quite dense area, still remains a pleasant place to live. It are the key decision moments, the defined course of action that possibly could be copied to the Netherlands. Het handige daaraan is dat je uh, zeg maar de elektriciteit, uh, riool, uh, openbaar vervoer. When we build in existing cities, the facilities like electricity, sewers, public transportation, schools, childcare, they are already present. Perhaps not enough, you do need to properly distribute or strengthen them. But still, building not outside but inside the city is also just cheaper. Particular attention goes to the West End, a residential neighborhood covering 35% of the downtown peninsula. Gordon Price talks about its history. And in the 50s, particularly 1956, when the zoning and development bylaw was passed for the first time, uh, a zoning code that we think of in a contemporary way, and it had this mechanism called floor space ratio that was a very simple way to calculate density based upon the size of the site. So in the West End, which was just rezoned overnight, I'm quite sure the council didn't realize what they were doing, along with many of the other old streetcar neighborhoods, they allowed for this emergent form of the small point tower. They didn't change, and this is what saved our ass, I think, they didn't change the street grid. They didn't create super blocks, which is the form that the Europeans used, particularly in their banlieue or suburbs. Uh, they used a, a late 19th century urban grid, uh, you know, 66 foot rights of way, based upon the first surveys. You could acquire lots, 33, 66 feet, but you had a lane in the back. So you had basically a small site and a relatively low FSR, floor space ratio, plot ratio, uh, somewhere between about one, two, three, somewhere in there. That's pretty low density and by world standards. Well, after the boom, the high rise boom, 1972, 71, the population would have been around, oh, 38,000. Population didn't even double, even though the housing stock increased five times with all those high rises. So what happened? Well, the West End uncrowded. People were living in these two and a half story, what looked to be a single family house on the surface, but from the attic to the basement, they'd all been cut up into suites. People would share the washroom down the hall and were fortunate to have a kitchen at all if they did. So when all of this housing stock was demolished, Almost overnight, people could move into, well, a one-bedroom apartment, 750 square feet roughly, sliding glass door, little balcony, maybe a swimming pool. Different kind of people, but nonetheless, it was a massive housing response to the exodus of young people, baby boomers, out of the suburbs and into downtown and the service jobs that were emerging. A massive increase in good quality, although from an architectural point of view, pathetic. <laughs> I mean, slab high-rise towers. Uh, but affordable to young people who had jobs nearby, kept downtown alive, provided a retail base, but didn't fundamentally change the urban form in this sense, that you still had that street grid, same sidewalks, same boulevards, same street trees, now trolleys running down where the streetcars would have gone, but basically the same urban form, one- and two-story retail, Robson, Denman, Davy. All that streetcar fabric was still intact, converted from streetcar to electric trolley, but no freeways. And that was the most important thing that didn't happen. So a tranquil residential neighborhood, right downtown, right next to the business district. John Lightburn and I go for a drive through the West End, together with architect Niels von Mayenfeld. 
you got to admit, this is pretty uh, lackadaisical driving. Here I'm in a fairly dense urban area, and I'm just sort of cruising around and not paying too much to street signs or anything. So, well, hardly people are walking across the streets. There's very little traffic here. There's almost no traffic. There's lots of people walking, though. Yeah, lots of people walking. So here's a totally different character from you know, any other nur urban in neighborhood in Vancouver. Like, this is a neighborhood that it's... The relative density is fairly high. It's very close to downtown Vancouver. And, you know, you see people bike riding, and there's one street with traffic on it, which is Denman Street, which is the commercial street uh, that subdivides the West End into two two halves, basically. And we're in the most quiet half, and... Literally, there's almost nobody driving on the streets. Now, this is a really nice street. Look at all the this, window boxes that yes. people have in their windows here. Uh, if you look carefully, there's all sorts of little fun details to these old buildings. Yeah. Like that that column stuck on the outside of the corner is, is, is wonderful. And one another thing that I think has had a real influence on Vancouver is that the original settlers were, they were Brits. And uh, all over the world, actually, the Brits brought their love of gardening. Here's a, a an old cottage that remains. Yeah. It's it's a it's done sort of uh, Tudor style, almost arts and crafts. There's some arts lovely and arts and crafts houses here. Martha Stewart. And the stonework yes. at the at this at the stairs is made out of uh, river L rock. Local river rock. Yeah. And look at the incredible flower garden that's, uh, and there's a big urn also sitting on, uh, on a portion of the steps. And uh, so this, this was something that, that the original people brought with them, uh, a, a love for nature and a love of gardening. And I think that's found its way into, into the streetscape of an old streetscape like this in Vancouver. Oh, I'm not so enthusiastic about it, frankly. It's uh, what I would call uh, outbollig. Do you know that word, Niels? Yes. Well, it is. And uh, he, he, what he's saying <laughs> is that it's it's old-fashioned, yeah. and and there's some truth to that. It's it's mm -hmm. uh, it's something that is so rooted in here that people don't even notice that it's getting a little bit fusty. Huh? Yeah. Well, we we in Vancouverites call this character houses. They 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 tend not to think about what. The architectural style is it's simply character house or uh, heritage These are preserved style. houses. Yeah. yeah, I myself I like it because I I find that a lot of the modern architecture is so bland and as Niels calls it anonymous that I, I do like these little old funny houses. Little old lady neighborhoods I call yeah. them. These are little old lady neighborhoods and but that's it was a lot of that around in the old days. Yeah. So we're sitting in a little traffic jam now and and. Uh, this is the price we pay for not having built freeways, and we we probably have traffic jams on them even if we had built them. This well, yeah, because you know what happened when cities like Seattle built freeways, the growth growth of suburban neighborhoods leapfrogged outside of uh, the city center, and uh, the city cores in major U.S. cities all kind of deteriorated. Vancouver, as I say, blocked this. Uh, idea of freeways into Stop the, the city. freeways Stop yeah. the freeways and so it's always had the most the best the best neighborhoods are always been cl those closest to the downtown Vancouver and whereas the uh, wealthy neighborhoods in cities like Seattle and Los Angeles are those that have gotten away from the downtown and of course the leapfrogging of tra of, of suburban development and then if uh, another fr which created immense amounts of traffic and traffic jams and then further leapfrogging beyond that so uh, the, the structure to the city of this sort of like the urban structure of Vancouver is different even is different from American cities and is actually even different from Toronto uh, we do have this uh, vibrant core that has never been sliced into pieces uh, and the best neighborhoods are those closest to the downtown, period. It's, they're the easiest to get to, and I don't think traffic's any worse than anywhere because I've, I've, I've driven through Seattle many times on, at rush hour, and it's, it's a nightmare. A nightmare. Motordom, as Gordon Price calls it. 
the exodus out of downtown to the green fields where land was cheap, where you could build post-war suburban housing, shopping centers, office parks, college campuses, everything separated, everything too far apart to walk, too dangerous to cycle and transit too infrequent. You had to drive. And it was designed that way and of course the people fully embraced that. So what's what's happening is that the fact that um, we have relatively few routes in and out of the central business district, in and out of the downtown, um, the fact that there is limited capacity has I think affected the course of development in a way that does not really increase the amount of traffic coming into the central because it, people find other means of doing it or people find places to live where they're not so dependent on having to do the daily commute. Quite normal for European cities but rather unique in North America here we see the urban paradigm of making a city not car friendly but walk, bicycle and public transportation friendly. Jan Timmer is an urban planner and architect. He is also a Dutchman, though working internationally and locally in Vancouver for 35 years. It's really an, a reversal of what the system used to be, where the engineering department in the city, in, in true North American fashion, really dictated what was going to happen and what the street profile would look like. That has totally changed. And one of the good examples is very near by where we are. Is, um, Granville Island, which is one of the most popular tourist attractions in Vancouver, where there's a happy mix of pedestrians, bicycles, public transit, and the cars are tolerated. But it's a real mix and it's not dangerous at all. So it can be done. And, it is, and I'm speaking here from a North American perspective because in Europe, these things, especially in the downtown areas of the major cities, are quite normal. And also in Europe, these things took a while for the local merchants to agree with. Once it was done, like in Copenhagen and in Germany and so on, it's been a great success. And so that's always being brought home here in North America as great examples. Uh, even New York City right now, we just had a lecture from the woman who um, took the paint can and Times Square and so on. They're all very much bicycle oriented. There are outdoor terraces now. It used to be just cars, taxis and so on. Right now it's totally transformed. And Bloomberg and Mrs. Sadi Khan did an incredible job convincing the local population that this was a good idea and it works. Granville Island, a successful bit of urban engineering, a famous section where nobody lives. Although called an island, it is in reality a piece of landfill right at the entrance of False Creek underneath the Granville Bridge. Once an industrial manufacturing area, the federal government decided in the 1970s to transform it as an amenity area centered around a market. A number of old sheds were converted to workshops, to retail businesses, a restaurants, theaters and a couple of hotels. But the architectural vocabulary was maintained. The wood post and beam structure, metal siding and metal roofing, giving the area a quite unpretentious personality. So there's a young, a young architect named Norman Hodson, who really hadn't done anything before in Vancouver, was given the assignment of coming up with a, a plan for Granville Island. An and urban plan. An urban plan. And he did a brilliant job. He, uh, apart from retaining just about anything that could be retained, um, he put forward the idea of having a, an environment where cars and pedestrians were really not in any way separated. Uh, it was intended that vehicles should move slowly enough so that people could walk safely at the sides of the roadways or across them. And I don't know whether this had ever been attempted before anywhere in North America. He introduced the idea of bollards to more or less uh, demarcate where cars would be and where pedestrians would be and where parking zones 
might take place. The parking happens everywhere. It happens on in open spaces within sheds. It's actually a huge parking lot today, Granville Island. Granville Island has grown from modest beginnings to what is now, I would say, one of the most cleverly disguised shopping districts you'll ever you'll ever find. In in the beginning, farmers from outlying districts could come in and sell their goods, and also um, uh, artisans and what is an artisan? An artisan is somebody who makes crafts, mm -hmm. and also people that had uh, food, different kinds of food, processed food products, jams, jellies, syrups, and that kind of thing. But in a quite a highly finished environment, uh, so this was immediately successful. And as time went by, the the market went upscale. What was originally a fairly good imitation of a market uh, became, in fact, a a shopping arcade for high end, shall we say, uh, experiential shopping. Yeah. And in, in smack dab in the middle of all of that, is there is still an industrial plant here, which is a cement plant. There's a cement plant here with many right in the very middle. cement trucks parked uh, right in the in the parking lot. And attempts have been made to to move the cement uh, plant and replace it with something uh, perhaps more revenue friendly to the owners. But actually, this has been resisted, strongly resisted. <laughs> We've got 25 large cement trucks parked here in front of the plant. And these cement trucks have Roar moved, in and out all move day long, in and out, and it doesn't cause any problem as far as I'm aware. In fact, I'm not sure. If, have you ever heard of anybody getting hit by a car or a truck here on Granville Island? Well, just the people I've run over today. <laughs> Everywhere there are little nooks and crannies for people to sit. There's some music being played here in, the, in a little square. Oh, yeah, the buskers come out in the summer and the fall and spring and they're, you know, uh, doing magic tricks and playing, playing, uh, playing their instruments. Oh, here's a French guy. Those people are sitting around listening to this music, eating uh, fish and chips and things of that nature. Hey, we got parking down here, guys. Let's bring the microphone. I'll stop. Okay. So the a group of French urbanists came to have a look at Vancouver not too long ago, and they made the comment that Vancouver is like a giant resort. And there's some truth in this. This city continues to grow. No one quite understands what's making what's making it go. Um, it hasn't stopped growing since the 50s. And I think one of the reasons maybe is, is because it, it, it is such a success in creating a lifestyle setting that offers many options and many ways to enjoy la dolce vita. I'm just heading us towards the washroom. <laughs> Are you going to the washroom? Right, when you talk, talk in, in this direction, okay? Test one, two. Test, test. Okay. We're now passing, uh, we're inside the, the market and we're passing um, a boutique where you can buy chocolates, six, 20 chocolates for $60. Yes. <laughs> Back here? Out there? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So you call this a success, but you also say it's kind of uh, a shopping mall in disguise. You mean that in, uh, in a sneaky, I, negative way? No, I was um, slightly cynical about the fact that what this market now offers is it's really beyond the financial reach of a lot of people. Mind you, you can still come here and have a slice of pizza and enjoy an ice cream. 
Right, and that opposed to uh, what a market is uh, normally, uh, or traditionally, it's a place where the uh, simple people buy their uh, goods. Where ordinary people can get right. a good deal. You don't get any yeah. good deals here. But as a lifestyle enhancer, it's fabulous. Yeah, precisely. I once heard a guy say that uh, the first generation in the country, the first successful generation in the country... I once heard a guy say that... The first generation makes money, then the second generation has got money, so they don't want more money, and they want power. Then the second generation has power and money, the third generation doesn't want that, so they go for art. And the third generation wants art, and it seems that you can see that here. Um, you can see that in what they sell at the local markets. I've lived on Pender Island, and there all you see uh, is not even apples as what you see here, but it's only pieces of art and uh, massages and uh, esoteric... Uh, growth phenomena. Precisely, yeah. As opposed Personal to growth phenomena. As opposed to what you would see in, in India on the market, it will be the essentials of life. That's correct, yes. So uh, we're standing now in a little waterfront square. Uh, the market wraps itself around. It's a lovely, lovely day. There are hundreds of people sitting here on benches, enjoying the warmth and the, the breeze. The, the water in the creek is reflecting the blue skies. It's slightly ruffled. And across the water, a very glamorous array of mostly light, light-colored high-rise buildings is uh, glowing in the sunlight. They're beautiful. Uh, the little ferries are crossing uh, the creek. There's a whole network of these that connect the downtown peninsula to where we are now. And for a modest fee, people can cross to come here to relax, enjoy themselves. Uh, and do some shopping. And lining the the shore on the other side are, and this is some another feature of Vancouver, an ever-growing armada of of expensive yachts and and vessels, sailing vessels of all descriptions. And we are uh, Granville Island is surrounded by small yacht basins, and uh, they they of course add a very colorful element to the scene as they reflect into the waters, but, and no one ever seems to be on these boats. <laughs> That's true, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it is an indication of the wealth of this city, that uh, so many people have the privilege of owning boats. Uh, and uh, it, it simply, it, you can't imagine a, a more refreshing, and uplifting scene than what we are experiencing here today. Life is good. Life is good. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's have a break. Let's, have, let's have a bite to eat. It stays on. Uh, yeah. Okay, it stays on. One cold Pepsi, please. Uh, and I'll have a ginger ale. Okay, ginger ale. Anything else? Uh, nothing, nothing to eat, no. Oh, now let's ginger, eat. Ginger ale. Ginger ale. Oh, boy. Bye, Mono. 320. For me? Uh, the, the yeah. And yes, life is good, but not everywhere in Vancouver. In Vancouver's social history, the western side of the city was considered to be the wealthy, white, Anglo Saxon, Protestant part. And the east side was traditionally a place for the working class and it was the dumping ground for immigrants. Nowadays the immigrants end up living in the suburbs because that is where the housing is least expensive. The poorest neighborhood where I live is known as the downtown east side, which is where Niels, John and I drive next. Look at this. I mean, there's people in wheelchairs, people in on the street. So people have set up a market here. There's, there's people selling all kinds of different things. There's some garbage around, but I don't think there's anywhere these people can put their garbage, as you know. Yeah. yeah. So these and are all street people, and there's like, actually, this is the busiest street in all of Vancouver, yeah. as far as the number of people on the sidewalk. 
And people are really interested when I'm talking into the microphone here as we slowly cruise by. It, people are looking in and you don't find that happening in many other places. They, nobody would take any notice of me. But actually, interestingly enough, here they do notice it. Well, living in this neighborhood, uh, this is a lot of people see this neighborhood also as a museum. They come here, take photos, uh, and, and kind of not realizing that the people here actually live here. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I often see people not being happy when people come here with film cameras. Because so, they might think they're freaks or something. Right. Well, look, look. What we're looking at here is this complex here was, go ahead. No, oh, you stupid woman. Just go around me. Okay. Anyways, right. we'll look at look across this vacant lot here, and we see the backs of a new condominium building right stuck in between two run-down, rather derelict older buildings. And then we go another block that way, and we're into the heart of Gastown, which is, again, a tourist area. So it's got this... The, this We've got this sandwich, but the, the, the center of the sandwich is, is uh, pretty seamy. <laughs> and now, you know, if you're a sort of a nice middle class person, the, the first reaction you might look at, have... Look at the graphics on that wall. Is, oh, isn't this awful? But I think um, that would be uh, a very slanted view. Of what's going on here, I think that's what's going on here is a tremendous ex effort at both rehabilitation and at. I don't know. I don't think there's much in the way of rehabilitation Green here, line. Niels. I think what it is is well, just I think the there city is. is, a lot is of people you you were talking about the city growing eastward. Mm -hmm. Well, here it here it's you know, there's the new urban edge right there. No pushed. Either. It's pushed its way in to the poorest part of the downtown east side. Mm -hmm. And it's going to continue to do so. And I guess basically it's going to crowd those people. Well, it's a, actually... Somewhere, who knows? I'm, I'm perhaps not the best person to talk about this because I don't live here and I don't mix with the people here, so I don't have a very clear viewpoint of, of what's going on. But I'm, what I'm t uh, trying to say is that this is their place where they can... You know, be where they can gawk back at the tourists. Yeah, <laughs> and I guess their view of normal society. Um, if or if I were in their position, I'd I'd look at normal society as a pretty strange bunch of people. Oh yes, yes, yes. You know, and um, I'm finding that the fact that it sits so smack in the middle of you know, huge development trends in Vancouver and that there are people um, buying condos in new developments here, right in the middle of, of all the dysfunction, is, is, is very interesting. And I think, it's quite I don't think yeah. that the, the situation here is as bleak as it could be because um, people are, there's a certain level of acceptance of what's happening here. Otherwise, people wouldn't move in here, and there wouldn't be uh, these developments cropping up right in the middle of all the street misery. So I think there's connecting happening here, and uh, I think a huge amount of international and national attention is focused on on the downtown east side, and it's a problem that nobody seems to have any answers for. But I do see a lot of channels that are there for communication and for some way forward for people. I think if you want to try and get yourself out of this situation, I think there's a lot there that could can help you. You may not be able to, but... but it's it's kind of interesting. Like, here we're back into this new urban development. It's just a half block away. Yeah. There's... It's this, just yeah. squeezing its way. Well, well, maybe that's the part that I'm trying to... Um, be positive about this that. is the new urban renewal it's not institutional or government funded it's private development mm -hmm. is funding it 
a lot of it is international money that sort of comes into Vancouver and uh, says, hey, we can profit here or we can park some money here. It's a safe place. You know, you can't say that it's your fault that you wound up this way because a lot of people have so many strikes against them from very early age onward. A lot of people, but I know. You, you see, I used to go to come down here to hire a guy to work for me, and he lived down on the east side. It was cheap. He was getting his welfare. He was getting paid under the table by me, and he was being able to spend all his money uh, on drugs but and gambling. Addict. You, you have to know the nature of addiction. That yeah. Addiction is is something that's really, really difficult to fight because you're wired to it. You know, it's like, yeah. uh, it's, it's, you if you read... You have a memory for the, addiction. Guys, I'm going to cut all this out. Yeah. We, none of us here is an expert on, on yeah. addiction. Yeah, yeah, we're just well, bullshit. We're just bullshitting at this point. We're going to round it. Well, we look at some of these east side, downtown east side residents and with disdain, but, uh, you know, I've known some and some of them actually like their lifestyle. Of course they do. Most of them do. Sure. It's, yeah. I mean, that's that's also been determined that not uh, people, uh, whatever state of life they're in, they don't want to change. Can go right. Can go right. Whoops. Here we are in Gastown, going the wrong way. Niels, do you know uh, Richard uh, Florida? Yes, I do. Okay. I, I heard him talk about how the the, the young generation of inventors and, and especially nowadays the creative engineers move to these areas where there's a lot of uh, diversification and strangely enough also the cities where they're that are welcoming uh, yes. gay communities yes um, so yeah the the, the, the cities with uh, that are, are welcoming uh, creative artists and, uh, and alternative lifestyles become breeding grounds for uh, new economies. That the artists are the first in there, yeah. and then that uh, because they often select the, the nicest spots and the uh, create and, and and are creative essentially, and that then those communities attract or are supplanted by other creative groups. I think you could say that about commercial, when the. Um, commercial drive because as the initial I don't think the initial um, transformation uh, was uh, by artists it came later it came when the Italian community uh, matured and began to move out into the suburbs and became less of a factor in the in the cultural life of commercial drive what came then this was in the 70s and 80s um, a new uh, alternative uh, people who were into alternative lifestyles, uh, a lot of um, not only uh, creatively but also with respect to sexual orientation, a lot of gay people, lesbian people settled in the commercial drive area and also uh, a lot of uh, creative people with not a lot of money but who, who needed to be in the city and saw it as a, as a place where you could buy cheaply and fix up and improve. Yeah, well, so, my daughter Shelley likes to say that when you're in gentrification, actually she did her thesis on the gentrification of Harlem, actually she had a little expression, she said uh, that first comes the gays, then comes the gals, because the gays go there because they, they, they find a place where they could live where they're, they're not going to be, you know, uh, uh, bruised, ostracized, whatever. The girls go there because they can relate to the gays and they feel somewhat safe with these gentlemen. And uh, then, <laughs> then, then the yuppies show up because you know here's 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 an interesting neighborhood where they can live, where prices have not gotten too high. And uh, it's so got there's character. kind of a, yeah, it's kind of a process that goes there that that Niels is referring to has happened in Commercial Drive. You know, and artists, of course. Mm-hmm. And the gays also make more interesting homes. They're better at decorating and, and precisely. Yeah, and they're willing to fix up something. And the artists do funky. nice things with with the yeah. dwellings they're in, and then. And the artists, of course, don't have as much money, so they go to where urban areas where properties are cheaper. Plus, not as mind-numbing as the concrete. Uh, yeah, concrete towers. My journey through Vancouver with Nielsen John continues. We drive to Vancouver's latest development, Olympic Village. So here we are at the uh, Olympic Village, which is just built for the built for the Olympics uh, athletes, 
and the scale and nature of the development even though it's uh, in terms of its time frame is not wow I'm just we're just going in it's not different you know it's 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 immediately following on the development on the north side of the false creek which is still going on and here we are into a development on the south side which west of us was done in a completely pastoral fashion and here we have this density which is almost draconian in some respects it's a different it's actually a totally different urban model from from what we've been just been looking at and, and discussing. And what we have here is a very rigid urban planning, considerable density, and instead of wide boulevards, there's these very narrow streets with... They remind me of alleys, actually. Yeah, they're very much like alleys, but with, uh, but with uh, very high buildings. How, high, how high, high are these buildings. buildings? Well, they're about eight stories. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, about eight stories. And, of course, there's these squares. Uh, there's one square in the middle of it. Yeah, which is a, definitely a, squ a square square. <laughs> but uh, with, with a wall of buildings around it. And it's not a big square. No, it's... Uh, it's like a quarter of a or city block, maybe. 200 feet by 400 feet, something like that. Well, not even 400 feet. I think it might there's be. A, there's some funny things here, John. There's there's some artwork. There's a giant... Um, worms. Wor are they and worms? A big, uh, well, there's a big giant bird there. Well, there's a, there's a tiny... There's a little bird. Well, normally it would be a junco or some kind of little sparrow yeah. that's been um, <clears throat> rendered to about uh, 100 times its natural size. Well, a thousand times, 10,000 times. I mean, it's... it's it's Very 15 feet high. <laughs> there's another one there in the Oh, trees. yeah, there's two of them. So there are these massive blow-ups of tiny songbirds looking at their feet here. The, the claws um, uh, the, the emanating from the feet are uh, about five inches long. So this is quite a strange kind of statement. I'm not quite sure what it, what it tries to say. The big birds, could it have been an attempt to... Um create an optical illusion to make everything look uh, smaller and more intimate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you could sure look at it that way. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you took a look at, if you, if you took a photograph of that bird against the buildings, you might think that, that those buildings are really just models. <laughs> something I'm noticing is that it's really actually quite quiet in here. I can, I, there's a couple of boys that are skateboarding, and the sound of their skateboards is, is, is about the only noise I can hear. Uh, the other thing I'm noticing is that the sort of traditional separation of street and sidewalk has been done away with here. It's just one, one except for on the corners where the streets meet, that it tends to be one continuous surface of um, pave, yeah. pavers. So there's a lot of unusual elements uh, to this project. Yeah. There's a girl sitting now doing some sketching. Uh, quite a variety of, of seating is available, and the square is open to the creek, I'm happy to say. Gordon Price looks at the Olympic Village project from a historic context. Olympic Village is just basically another variation and, and a direct continuation of the ideas that emerged in this remarkable period in the 70s. Uh, I mean, think of the risk that was involved down here. you got to remember the False Creek was just a polluted industrial basin. It was awful. Yeah, and people have no idea how bad it was. They built the seawall on the south shore of False Creek so you couldn't touch the water. You go along there and you'll see how it's slanted. Uh, so bad was the water quality. The air, unbelievable. From Broadway, you wouldn't even be able to see sometimes the downtown office towers, much less the North Shore Mountains. There were beehive burners just burning you know, wood right into the environment, just dumping nasty stuff into the water. Well, that's all uh, changed, and it changed very, very fast. But back then, the idea that you would build a residential development, a place where families could raise children on the shores of False Creek, some people thought that was just nuts. Uh, some wanted it to keep it purely industrial, like uh, Harry Rankin, basis for jobs. Some, like George Peel, head of the park board at that time, wanted it nothing but park. Very few people thought 
the risk of trying to provide a residential neighborhood down there would pan out well. Uh, and yet it turned out to be one of the genius things we did. Let's give credit to Walter Hardwick back then, geographer at UBC who got elected as one of the first team councillors. When they were in the majority, uh, they really pushed ahead with it. Well, they were acquiring land. The city was acquiring land. That's the only reason they could go ahead with the development. They owned it. Uh, and the same with the southeast shore of False Creek. But when I was in council there, we wanted to raise the bar on sustainability. So that was put into the kind of the direction that the southeast project would have to uh, pursue. The Olympics wasn't even on the table at that point. And, and so it has reflected itself, first of all, in the spirit of the city will direct development and use its land base as a way to do it. It will try to achieve social and environmental goals, and it will try and push the bar. It will try and do something only the city can do. Otherwise, you might as well just sell the land off and, and put in terms of the contract the whatever it is that you want the developer to meet, just more or less, in this case, the way it happened, but only because the city could lever that. Now, mistakes were made, obviously, but if, if someone could have predicted a global financial crisis, and a developer who unwisely overbid, and construction costs that you know were very high at that point in time, yeah, you'd probably make the different decisions. But the city followed through on the spirit, I think, of the 70s, and established that it was appropriate for a civic authority to try and do something that would reflect our values and raise the bar and provide more housing stock in a city for whom that's always going to be a fundamental issue. Now, does it meet everybody's expectations? Did it work out well financially? Obviously not. So we should never do anything like that again? Is that really the conclusion you want to draw from it? The city should get out of that business, sell off its land holdings, let the market determine what's viable, put in terms of bylaws, uh, those things you want to meet, uh, environmental criteria, rather than actually lead the way? Uh, I would have a different opinion. <laughs> Back in the car with Niels and John, Niels notes something about the aesthetic appearance of the plants and trees. The other thing I've noticed that the, the, the landscaping here, because the streets are so narrow, consists of very uh, narrow varieties of trees. And I'm actually noticing that some of them are planted close to the buildings and are bumping their heads up against uh, overhanging balconies, which is a really strange sight to see uh, a new tree, maybe 15 feet high, bumping into a projecting overhang. And it's been uh, generously planted so that in time, uh, this will give a completely different sheltered aspect to the square. Well, it's hard to say because these look like kind of dwarf species of trees. These are not like the London plane trees that grow into giant specimens that you know that shelter even uh, you know five-story buildings but i've noticed that we've got this uh reminiscence of canadian the canadian myth because in the landscaping is reflected in the landscaping because here we see there uh we've got wheat grass which has been planted in these square boxes and the wheat is in bloom. It looks like you could go out there and harvest and harvest and grind yeah, the wheat they're, and they're, make they're, bread. There are planters that actually do have gra only grasses growing in them, and they're somewhat reminiscent of what you might find along a, a pond or a bog. Uh, so there's different varieties. So well, it immediately gives me images of the prairies where you know we, where the wheat used to grow. You know, as Canadians. That's said, right. It's six, like a little feet. reminder of of somewhere else altogether. Yeah. yeah. So I decided to talk to one of the landscape architects working on the Olympic Village. Here is Peter Kruk, who talks about his involvement in the design for this neighborhood. They had to design an atmosphere where people feel comfortable getting to know their neighbors. As designers, we created a stage where these interactions can happen. There's plazas, there's courtyards, there's waterfront, there's community center. These are the places where people are going to gather, get to know each other, and build a community. So hopefully in five, ten years' time, you can walk down the street and say hello to Bob and Jane, and you know they're the grandkids over for the weekend again. And... That's what we want to happen in our spaces, and we have to create the places for it. Um, the attempt at the Olympic Village is one of to create community. The objective there is was to have a commercial core, which included 
you know, your, your needs for grocery and, and banking and coffee shops and restaurants at, as a core, supported by a fair density of residential, which in Vancouver, the objective here is, is to have a, a wide range of, of housing types so that the wealthy, as well as the, the poor, cannot live in a neighborhood, not all of one type, so you don't create rich ghettos and you don't create ghettos for the poor, but you, you have a blend of people. Uh, there's a community center that, that's supposed to function as the heart. So what we're doing is creating something from nothing because there was nothing there to start with. And communities are very, can't, I don't think can be created overnight, but as planners, landscape architects, architects, we try to put the bits and pieces in place which allow the community to evolve over time. So there's facilities there uh, without the people uh, you don't have community. Without the density, you don't have community. Niels and John, with whom I'm still at the Olympic Village in a car, take note of the character of the buildings. Uh, from the outside, it looks uh, singularly, shall we say, uh, machine-tooled. It, it's, uh, the architecture is... Con- high-tech, it's, 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 very high-tech. It's, it's, it's the new modernism again, which we've had around for about 20 years now since postmodernism we see a lot of glass we see a lot of metal we're actually beside a drugstore well it hasn't opened yet uh, but i i wouldn't have guessed that it was going to be a drugstore uh, because the fenestration is sort of again a kind of anonymous it's as if they're made to look uh, they're tucked away uh, with enormous shall we say, uh, well, I guess I'm getting a little bit of a loss for word now, but there's an attempt not to make commercial activities look like commercial activities. They're looking, they're concealed, they're downplayed, they're made to seem less there. And I wonder if that's an attempt to maintain the privacy of these type of types of new developments. They don't want people from the outside coming in and animating these places. They are intended for the local residents only. Nobody wants to have um, a party here, it looks like. It looks like this is it's kind of very low-key uh, living where there's, mind you, not many people are here yet because this is, this is another little bit of history that uh, perhaps we should mention, John, which is um, how this project ran into financial difficulty. Yeah. All right, furthermore, uh Look, there's an electric vehicle charging station here. Oh, heavens, yes. So, you know, the other thing that should be noted oh, about no kidding. <laughs> this, this project is that it has, it is extensively green, uh, and it, has, uh, it conforms to some of the highest uh, rankings for sustainability and eco-friendliness. You would never get that impression, though, from looking because everything is hard surface, hard edge. The plaza is at least 95% uh, paving stones, and the landscaping is, you know, like I say, a few grasses in, within uh, some planted, square mm-hmm. planted areas, pl- planters, and uh, the trees are miniature. So it's kind of funny that this is representative of green architecture and in the sense, Green John, urbanization we're, 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 we're because not it, growing anything here, are we? <laughs> yeah, because or are we? Are we inside these? Some of these, uh, um, L, um, we have sort of mini blocks. The buildings that that line the the streets here are create interior courtyards, and I know that the <coughs> the roofs of those, in, or in, which themselves are somewhat raised up above the ground, these courtyards, and the roofs of these are private green space for people. And yeah, indeed, we have a lot of green roofs in the latest developments in Vancouver. I talked about this with Peter Kruk. Our marching orders are, are, are through planning are, are to create a, a village that is, in plan view, there's 50% green. So to look down on the site, 50% of the area you see has to be from green above. from above. So if you look at the where plan nobody where nobody looks, but that... The idea there is that it has to be green, which means it has to be living. There has to be plant material there. 
and I, I have a 30 year time frame to look at this as a landscape architect. When I first came here, the amount of landscape on a project was fairly limited. Uh, shrubbing up the edges is what we called it. Uh, we had, definitely had some commercial buildings which would have plazas and such, but uh, to develop roof podiums, to, to develop green roofs uh, on various levels, to, to have the, the sense of kids play urban agriculture. Urban agriculture wasn't talked about three years ago, and now pretty well every project we do has some component of, of gardening. Uh, for, so people who live in the building can go there and participate in gardening. Uh, the outdoor patio spaces on roofs have become much, much larger than they were before. Developers never saw the opportunities in these outdoor patio spaces, which are now they realize that people will pay a lot more for a unit that has a nice big outdoor patio space that, that overviews the city. Uh, it's exciting. It, it opens up so much to us. Vancouver is now trying to bill itself as, as uh, one of the world's foremost green cities. Yeah. And I, to, to me, this doesn't feel green at all. I mean, you know... The idea was to reduce the load on the larger systems by using high-tech approaches to minimizing consumption of energy and, and resources. So that's a kind of invisible aspect of this project. Uh, yeah, definitely invisible because it doesn't have a that doesn't have a green feel to it in my ex except for this electric vehicle charging station that is <laughs> stuck uh, like a sort of large transformer box. Uh, into the uh, into the square that we are sitting next to. So I guess if you want to charge your car, you've got to bring it here, and uh, rather than doing that from your from your residence. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. The graphics on that station there, because it kind of looks like a flame from a natural gas source to me. <laughs> Doesn't it though? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'm noticing several things too. The the reeds that are part there of the grass. Now, uh, coming from Holland, I immediately recognize them from uh, the the type of grass that grows in in canals where the the water is not reeds, running very yeah. fast. Yeah. So it it gives me a, a Dutch impression. Yeah. Um, Tristan has felt that this is a kind of, when we drove through the other day, this is really reminiscent of the new towns in Rotterdam, I think you said. Well, it started in Rotterdam because that was uh, that had to start building new stuff after the war, but yeah. also in m more modern neighborhoods uh, elsewhere in the Netherlands. Yeah, uh, yeah I certainly get that impression by the, the intimacy uh, that we have here, uh, and also the, the, the this may all be new, this, this square, but they look it looks like it almost uh, was planned to not be completely straight. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, you want the, the running water, the, the, the rain water, to flow towards the drains. The drains up there, but I think they kind of overdid it, maybe on purpose to make it look not so new, mm -hmm. maybe not so sterile. Also, mm -hmm. the gutter in the street is in the middle of the road. Yeah. I've never seen that anywhere in North America yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. The people that we have seen walk here on this piece of the road have all walked in the center of the road and not on the sidewalk. Yeah. Right, that's interesting. Noteworthy details that journalists from all over the world would see when the Olympic athletes arrived in the winter of 2010. It makes sense that the city wanted to create a neighborhood that was not something just okay, but something very special. In the last hour we have looked at several of Vancouver's neighborhoods some obvious choices when profiling Vancouver. The West End, Granville Island, Downtown Eastside, and the Olympic Village. The total picture is of course much more complex. Greater Vancouver, a mosaic of urban curiosities. Here a last remark by Gordon Price emphasizing that it could be easy to overlook interesting development happening in the suburbs surrounding Vancouver. Because Vancouver, yeah, it's by and large done. I mean, we built it out. It, it will change. But the real issues, I think, are the emerging um, change in the post-war suburbs. Places like Surrey that are going to go through their own form of urbanization, their own form, ways of dealing with, quote, sustainability issues. Uh, this remarkable change that's going to occur between the post-war era and whatever era we're going into. And I think that's where the suburbs are more than Vancouver. I think they're much more willing to make 
changes in Richmond, uh, parts of the North Shore, certainly Surrey. Maybe maybe the Northeast sector once Evergreen Line arrives. Certainly Port Moody did. Um, Port Moody took a lot of the Vancouver style and really took a, a risk in concentrating it in its downtown core. Remarkable scale. Far more of interest to many of the people who I show around often than downtown Vancouver. Um, it's going out into the suburbs and seeing how that change is occurring, how they've learned urban skills and techniques from what we did down here and then begin to apply it, quote, out there. All part of the same region. But uh, if we're going to get 80% of our growth inside that boundary, they're the guys who really make the difference. And then they will take the pressure off Vancouver. Uh, the idea that someone should show up here and they can expect to live in Vancouver, eh, it's going to be tough to pull off. This was episode zero of The Knots. A total of 10 hours was recorded and all are available on the website. In addition to the neighborhoods that ended up in this episode, together with Niels and John, I visit the north side of False Creek. There's something distinctive about this, this bit of the, of the downtown. Stanley Park. We're standing on the seawall. The tide has gone out. We've got this rocky foreshore in front of us. Strathcona. More than worthwhile to fix and repair and turn into their little urban uh, uh, cottage. And Chinatown. At one time, just about every corner grocery store in all over Vancouver would be owned by Chinese people. But also interviews with both of them individually. John Lightburn talks about his time as an architect working in Saudi Arabia. They kept rejecting it because they kept seeing hidden uh, Christian symbols in the planning of the university. I interviewed architect Niels von Meyenfeld in Dutch, and we discussed things like his youth in the city of Amsterdam. Now, Amsterdam is also afgemaakt. Hè? Als een klein kind heb ik mijn fiets gereden in Bosplan. And that vond ik heerlijk. Here is an excerpt of my recording with Jan Timmer, who describes how he first got interested in architecture. I'm very much um, inspired by um, being alive as a human being and being part of nature. So I'd like to express that in my profession. We hear Peter Kreuk describing parallels between his personality and his work as a landscape architect. Everything in our house had a place. So everything, you know, I can still go home to my house now and I can tell you where the towels are, like where, where everything's put away. And it's still very much how we approach the landscape. Everything has a place. Everything has a function. And in particular, I recommend checking out my 45 minutes together with urban planner and former politician Gordon Price. The, the net result, when you add up all the buildings done by all the individual architects, reads as a cohesive place that functions well for the people who have to live in it and can adapt to change over time. I'm not sure how well we've done on that. And lastly, also in Dutch, my talk with Eline Toes from the government of the Netherlands. I think Vancouver is a hele, een hele, hele prettige woonstad. It is, it is wat braaf, zeg maar. All recordings are available along with the show notes and a full transcript at thenots.com slash zero. And remember, it is the knots, not knots. T-H-E-N-O-T-S dot com.